15 years ago, I spent a long time drawing blueprints. Lots and lots of time drawing blueprints for my, my landscape design, maintenance, construction business that I ran for about 10 years. And I would spend time with the customers, figure out what they would want their landscape to look like or what they wanted excavated out and rebuilt or the fresh landscape to look like in their new house. And then I would go to the drawing board, literally, because I didn't have fancy computer programs, so I'd go to my Alvin drafting board. How many of you ever used one of those before? All right. We have maybe some old Kettering University students here and things like that. Yeah, you pull up the drafting board, and so you start drawing out blueprints. And then we would go to the job site, and with, you know, the employees, they would get to work, but at certain points along the way, inevitably, they would forget we might lose sight of the specific plans. You kind of get carried away. You get into a job and you, you might think, oh, we got to change this or change that. So we'd have to what? Go back and look at the blueprints. Are we doing what we told the customer we would do to their satisfaction? Are we doing what this blueprint says so that it comes out the way that they paid for and what they expect. Blueprints were essential. We, everything we did needed to align with the blueprints. Many of you have jobs like that as well. Everything you do has to align with the blueprints, with the plans, or with the CAD drawings, or whatever the case may be. When Jesus Christ came, His words and His works were a proclamation of God's grace and truth. It says in John chapter 1, we beheld His glory, glory as of the unique one, the only one, one and only one, sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth were realized, came to be known in Jesus Christ, that Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, when He came, He was showing us the blueprints through his life, through his way, his word, everything that he did, everything that he said pointed toward his identity that he was, in fact, the one true and only Messiah. Now, when we put our faith into Jesus Christ, when we put our trust into him, we enter into this relationship that doesn't come by a means of our religious effort and all our good behavior, all the things that we do can't bring us into right relationship with God, but Jesus, the Christ, is the one who erases our sin debt and gives us life forever with God, eternal life with God when we place our trust into him. But then we begin this walk of what in the Hebrew would have been called the Talmud, Talmud, being a Talmud, a disciple, or in the Greek New Testament translated matetes, to be a follower, to be a disciple of Jesus. That is, so we enter into this relationship with God through placing our faith into Jesus Christ, and then we follow Him, which literally means that we walk behind him. We walk right in his footsteps along the trail of life, that we do what he does. We say what he says. We think the way he thinks. And we, we exemplify, we glorify God through showing the life of Christ, putting his life on display through our life. But this isn't something that we can do in our own strength. It's by the Holy Spirit's power who indwells us, and by the Word of God, which works in us the life of Christ, so that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is evident in our lives, so that the life of Christ is on display. That's what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. So we're justified, made right in God's sight through faith in Christ, and then we begin this walk of following in Jesus' footsteps. And Jesus' words and Jesus' works in the Gospels are like the blueprints for being a disciple of Jesus so that God's work through the Word and by the Holy Spirit makes us more and more like Jesus Christ. So I have to ask myself this question, ask yourself this question this morning. Does my life honestly before God look more like Jesus than it did 10 years ago or five years ago or three months ago? Is there a movement forward in my life, in your life, of progressive sanctification? That's the $10 theological word, right? You know, we're justified, then we're being sanctified progressively, this process as a disciple of Jesus. 
Is your life, is my life looking like the blueprints? Because here, here's the problem, here's the tension that I face, I know that all of you face, if you're, if you're, if you're walking, following Jesus' sandal prints, that we think we know what His blueprints are like. We, we think we know the plans until we look at them closely again and we, we realize we veered off at certain points. So we need repeated exposure to the blueprints. Amen? <laughs> you hear that? By peering into this book, God's Word, and being confronted with what Jesus said and with what Jesus did and, 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 and feeling the heartbeat of God through Christ's public ministry because that's how we're, we're confronted again with the blueprints of what Christ's mission is all about and it, it, it upends our preferences, our prejudices. It runs into conflict with our sinful flesh and desires, our immoral, greedy, materialistic propensities, all of that. That's what Jesus' blueprints do. The, the mission blueprints of Jesus are always running up against what I want, what me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, wants, right? And what you and I are naturally prone to wander into. So we need to look again afresh at the blueprints, at the blueprints. So what are Christ's mission blueprints? I want us to turn to Mark chapter 6. Verses 30 to 56, and we're, we're going to look at a pretty big chunk of Scripture here. It is all tied into one unit, perhaps two units, but you're going to see a thematic line across this big chunk of Scripture, and we're aiming to finish through the Gospel of Mark by Easter time next year, but we're going to take a few weeks off for the Christmas season here shortly. So we're taking some pretty big chunks, but looking at the central point of each chunk of Scripture, and we're going to look at the blueprints. What are, what are Christ's mission blueprints here in this passage? Now, all throughout the Gospels, there's all kinds of blueprints. We need to get into those plans. That's why we're going through the entire Gospel of Mark, because we want to spend time, have patience in the Word of God so that we're immersed in it so that our eyes don't veer away from it, so that we don't just suppose that we're following the way of Jesus. We know if we are or if we are not, right? Are you, on with, are you with me on this? All right. So Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30, our youth pastor Keegan did a great job last Sunday, didn't he? He's driving back from Iowa, I think in the snow today, and we'll see him back in the office, probably with a coffee in hand. And so I'm thankful for his time that he spent talking about how the disciples were sent out on Jesus' mission, and then this interlude about John the Baptist being beheaded. And we understood that to follow Jesus Christ certainly will be a path of a hostility, of opposition from those who are anti-Jesus, anti-the truth, anti-gospel. We live in that kind of culture today, just as the first century disciples did. And so the way of following Jesus isn't easy. It's, it's countercultural. It's counterintuitive. It's, it's counter self. It means to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow Jesus all the way to Calvary. That's the walk of following Jesus Christ, but one of ultimate reward and eternal hope and everlasting kingdom that will be ours in Jesus Christ. And so the disciples then gather back with Jesus here. Look at verse 30. The apostles, that is the 12 here, they gathered together with Jesus. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. Are you there? Yes. And they reported to him all that they had done and taught, and they were certainly excited. They had been, they had been by the power of God, seeing people healed, and they were, they were casting out demons and seeing people walk a whole new life as they taught them the truth of the gospel. And he said to them, come away by yourself to a secluded place and rest a while, for there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Jesus had found himself in this position already before, to the point where his relatives were saying, you know, as he lost his mind, he's working his tail end off, and all these people want to get near him, and he's, he's not even eating. You know, come out here, Jesus, come out of the house, I've got a casserole for you. That's what his, we find what his mother's doing earlier in this book. So here he says to his disciples, though, come away 
come away to a secluded place. Verse 32, they went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. So just briefly here is a pattern in Jesus Christ that rest in Christ is essential for ministry fruitfulness with Christ. So often I can forget that, can't you? (laughs) Jesus said in John 15 in his upper room discourse, close in teaching with the disciples, he said, abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing, not on a little bit, nothing can be accomplished of any eternal value, of any significance consequence for the good of others and for the glory of God without God's power working through you, apart from you abiding in the vine, who is Jesus Christ. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so he, he calls the disciples away to rest. So we, too, look back, you know, we can get into a hurry of ministry, of good activity, Advent season is full of hurry, full of good ministry, good things. Everything that the disciples and Jesus were about was good, right? They were, they were teaching, they were healing, they were serving the sick, the needy, those in desperation. It was all good, right? Yes? Yes? But they needed a rest because they're still human. Jesus, fully God, fully human, fully man. And we're fully human and in need of rest. So remember that. You might want to write that down. It's not in your bulletin notes, but it's free, free of charge this morning. Resting in Christ is essential for ministry fruitfulness in Christ. And when I forget that, Matt, remind me or kick me in the shins, okay? All right, Matt's my man over there. I need guys like Matt. And you need guys like Matt. If you don't have somebody guiding you along and holding you accountable to rest and to do as God calls you to do. Look out, look for somebody like that right now. Verse 33, so now here we're going to see these three things that are characteristic and they're repeated throughout the Gospels, characteristics or blueprints from Jesus' life, okay? Jesus' life that we need to see. The first one is this, Jesus saw. Jesus saw. The people saw them going, And many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. What's going on? So Jesus has been busy ministering in Capernaum, and his disciples have been busy, and there have been these giant crowds coming into this part of Galilee from all over the place, from Tyre and Sidon, as far north as that all the way down into Judea and south of Judea, Idumea. These people are gathering. Thousands upon thousands of people are hearing about this man who teaches with amazing authority, who astounds the Pharisees, who's healing the sick, even raising the dead, and they want to get near him. And so these people see that, that, them away, and they, they charge around to the lake. It's, pro- it's about six or eight miles, this distance they're going to travel around the lake. Jesus is going to, he went there uh, you're going to find that he's, he's making these boat trips around. And so it would have been four or five miles to this next destination. But when Jesus went to shore, okay, when Jesus went to shore, he sees thousands of people out there. They don't really get the rest that they were looking for for very long. So much need. Certainly facing physical exhaustion. And he saw a large crowd. This is repeated in Matthew chapter 9, in Luke's account of this feeding that we're going to see, this feeding of the 5,000, in the Gospel of John as well, that Jesus saw them, and he saw them, and he was moved with compassion. Jesus saw people for who they really were. Jesus looked at people, and he didn't just breeze by. He looked at them in the eye, he knew what was going on in their heart, and he didn't just rush by. And so often, I'm convicted, when I look at the blueprints of Jesus and I go, he really saw people, how often do I just not see people, really see people for their need, for what they're really going through? It's kind of like we drive through town, I live in Flushing Township, So I head this way all the time, back and forth, back and forth, all the time. You've got landmarks, we've got landmarks that I drive by, 
and, and we've seen them a thousand, two thousand times, and what happens when we see that landmark or that store or that sign a thousand times? We don't see it anymore. And that's how it is often with the people that are around us all the time. Think about all the people that are in lostness, spiritual lostness, in darkness, and we, we are surrounded by people in need, many of whom don't even know what kind of need they have spiritually. Many of them are aware of their apparent physical need, but they don't know their spiritual need, but they walk by us. We talk to them at the gas station, or we talk to them at the grocery store, or we talk to them in our workplace, or we talk to them in our neighborhood. Perhaps we, we walk by them in our neighborhood. We just walk by, we walk by, but we don't really look at them. I don't really look at them. It's like the landmark that I've just driven by a thousand times. I don't see it anymore. I have to ask myself, do I even know how to knowledgeably pray for my neighbor? The way that I will be able to knowledgeably pray for my neighbor is if I've really seen my neighbor, to love my neighbor enough, to pray for my neighbor, to love my neighbor. That sounds familiar. Other words of Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. How many times do I look at myself in the mirror Every day, or else my hair wouldn't be combed, my teeth wouldn't be brushed, and my wife would be going, Michael, and you'd be all going, did you shave in the last four months? Clean your nostril hairs out. Look in the mirror, buddy. We look in the mirror all the time. Jesus sees the multitudes. Do we see them clearly, fully, for who they really are, for where they, where they are at spiritually, where they are at physically? Both needs matter to God. Both needs of our neighbor should matter to us. They matter to Jesus. Jesus' blueprints. He saw them. Jesus saw the multitudes. He saw them. He looked at them. And then his response, and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. This is repeated throughout the Gospels. This is repeated also, this phrase, sheep without a shepherd. It's repeated in Numbers 27, verse 15 to 17. I want you to see this very quickly. Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27. I want you to see verses 15, 16, 17. Then Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, Appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them and who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherd. So Moses is asking God for God to appoint someone who will really guide them, who will really see them for their needs, who will really lead them into protection and provision Moses, appointed by God, led the people of Israel, but did he have faults and failures? Absolutely. But then, interesting, in, in 1 Kings and in 2 Chronicles and in, in Ezekiel 34, this exact phrase is repeated, not this time from someone praying that God would give those kinds of leaders to his people, but actually prophets of God declaring that, that the kings who claimed to be leaders over God's people were terrible, were immoral, were godless, didn't care for God's word, didn't care for God's people, were filled with greedy gain, immorality. And so the prophets of God said, my, my people, God's people, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd die. Bugs get into their wool, and sheep die because they can't do anything about it. I mean, I, I grew up with a Labrador Retriever, and she could scratch bugs off her neck. I've never seen sheep scratch bugs off themselves, right? I mean, they're really helpless creatures. So if, a, if bugs, there's certain type of bugs that like to get into the wool of, the, of sheep, and then they burrow into the skin, it can cause a huge infection, and the sheep will just die. They get bugs in their gums, and they die from that, and they, they have to be led along to green pasture, and they have to be led to water. They can't find anything for themselves. 
They just have to see, they see what's right in front of them. That's it, right? And Jesus looks out over the multitudes of people. And they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're out on what scholars would agree is this, this plain north of Bethsaida at this point. And it's green grass at this time of the year. And all these people, we're going to find out 15, 20,000 people all out on these rolling green hills and they're just wandering, looking, searching for the truth. What is the gospel of the kingdom? And the people that God had set about to lead them, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the religious establishment, they're in it for greedy gain. They're in the pocket of the Romans or vice versa. They're trying to get what they can, fleece the people of everything that they can, not protecting, not providing, not guiding. It's all in it for themselves. And Jesus is moved with compassion. It's this word splogna, which means your inner intestines. Ever had that feeling when you look at something, maybe on the news, or you encounter someone, and you just start weeping from the inside out? Ever had that experience? Where you just... God, help them. What can I do to help them? You just start weeping, and then the tears start flowing out of your eyes, and you can't stop it. Lord, God, help this person. Jesus shows us the blueprints. He saw the multitudes, and and he didn't just move on. It sunk in, and he felt deep, innermost compassion for this flock of people out there. Jesus saw and Jesus felt. If the life of Christ is within us, then compassion will flow out of us. If the life of Christ, if you have entered into that relationship with Christ that I explained at the beginning, you put your faith into Christ. He's the one. He's the rescuer. He's the Messiah. He brings you into right relationship with God. At that moment, when you trust in Christ, you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence inside of you. The Holy Spirit fills you with power for service. The Holy Spirit seals you secure until the final day of redemption. And so that same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, and you are being changed from glory to glory into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Is that the reality in your life? If the life of Christ is within us, then His compassion will flow out of us. The blueprints give us a rude awakening. Give me a rude awakening, don't they? Is this really how I respond to all the thousands of people that pass before my eyes every day? Or do I just hurry on? Or do I see them, but then I don't really let it sink in so that I feel it? Oh, don't get clinical callous toward the compassion of Christ. People of God, Let the life of Christ flow out of you so that you feel with compassion. And I'm preaching to myself too. Jesus saw, Jesus felt, and he began to teach them many things. Jesus responded. It's not just good enough to see and to feel, which is where a lot of people stop today And then they jump on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and tell how they feel, but they never actually respond the way Jesus responded, right? I'm going to say what I'm feeling and I'm going to tell you what I saw, but Jesus goes into the mess of everything and of the need of the people in the whole multitude. He walks right into the crowd. These are the blueprints of Jesus for Jesus' followers, And he began to teach them many things. In the other parallel passages in the Gospels, it talks about how Jesus healed them and taught them together. He was 
proclaiming there's this primacy of the preaching of the gospel with Jesus, that he is there to herald the good news because their spiritual need is ultimate. Our spiritual need is ultimate, that we and everyone out there that passes by this building, that walks by your home, that you see in your workplace, who is lost, they need to have the cure, who is Jesus. Jesus is the good news, who redeems us and brings us back into relationship with God. So Jesus is teaching them the gospel of the kingdom. He's proclaiming the good news. The kingdom of heaven is within your grasp, and you can enter in through placing your faith into Jesus Christ. And so he's teaching them, and he's healing their physical needs with his power, and these thousands of people spread around. And then here, we're going to see how Jesus responds. Jesus responded by teaching them and by serving them, both, both hand in hand. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and it is already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. They probably were looking forward to the rest, weren't they? I would have been. Okay, it's been a long day. It's the end of the afternoon. Dusk is almost upon us. Bethsaida would have been, you know, fair distance. They could have walked there. Jesus' response is shocking here. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. Exclamation point. Do you see that? What? (laughs) So here's what, we know this is Philip because it's recorded in the Gospel of John. Philip said to him as the representative for the whole group, Shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? In the Gospel of John chapter 9, you can read about this. 200 denarii would have been like eight to nine months of labor. A denarii was considered a day's wages. So it's like saying, Philip's kind of like saying, you know, if we had $40,000, which we don't, Because you just sent us off on this mission and all we took with us was just like a belt and a tunic and you said, you know, don't take any money sack or anything. So if we had $40,000 and and we bought a little bit, a a small portion, that wouldn't even be enough to give everybody a little bit, 200 denarii for all these people. How do you expect us to do this? To give them something to eat. And he said to them, he doesn't answer that question he said, how many loaves do you have? Go look. <laughs> There's a lesson in here. The, the disciples respond shockingly with sarcasm. They do. You give us, we're going to give them something to eat, all these people? 5,000 men plus women and children, fifteen to 20,000 people? We don't have that kind of money, and even if we did, we'd only give people a little bit. And that, how is that going to work? A refusal to trust in Christ often shows up in sarcasm. Unbelief often shows up with sarcasm. Every day we're encountering all kinds of massive need. We can look out at the, our community here. We can look at the needs in our own church family. We can go, okay, God, we've got... Five biscuits and two pickled fish. We don't have $40,000 for this, which is true, but God provides for his work done his way will never lack his supply. We can look at the needs in our church family and say, you know what, we want to help this, these people, we want to do this in our community, we want to serve this way. We don't have it. Don't fall into sarcasm, which is rooted in unbelief or refusal to trust in Christ. Oh, I hear it come out of my mouth. Sometimes I hear it come out of other folks' mouths. (laughs) You know, just being honest in church. It came out of the disciples' mouths. So we know it's a common sin. Don't let that rule your heart. Oh, may not let, no, may not rule my heart. Instead, Trust in the power of Christ that he can do his work. He can provide 
God can do the impossible. So the disciples go out, and you know the story. It's, this is the only, there's only two miracles that are repeated across all four Gospels. The resurrection on the third day and the feeding of the 5,000. You know that? And so, you know from other parallel passages that they find this lad, this young boy who has five loaves and two fish, but they are pickled fish. And loaves, they're not a whole loaf like you'd buy at Kroger or in Meyer. They were the size of a fist, like a biscuit, enough for one boy to eat lunch. One pastor said at least one mother actually looked out for her child that day. I mean, everybody else apparently had nothing, you know? They find one kid with five biscuits and two pickled fish. That's lunch for one boy my son's age. And so the disciples... <laughs> take the kid's lunch. Maybe they bring him over, you know, and they're like, hey, come over here. Okay, we got five loaves, two pickled fish, Jesus. Unbelief still in their heart. You can hear it between the lines. Jesus doesn't respond to sarcasm. Jesus doesn't respond to their refusal to trust. Instead, he just commands them. Look at verse 39. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. Don't miss this parallel from Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Jesus is the true shepherd king who will be the answer to Moses' prayer. Jesus is the true shepherd Messiah who fulfills, who fills up David's psalm in Psalm 23 from Numbers 27. Who fulfills that? Jesus. Jesus is the one who will guide the sheep so that they won't be like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is the one who will give them food and restoration for their soul across the green pastures. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the, fu- the food. He gave thanks, this word Eucharist, or Eucharisteo, to bless it, to give thanks. He broke the loaves and kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. <laughs> this movement here, he took and he blessed, he broke And he gave is repeated in Mark chapter 14 when Jesus has the last supper with the disciples. That is not by mistake. That's not by mere coincidence because this is a a movement forward showing that there is a supper to come that will also then be repeated in the marriage supper of the Lamb, that great banquet, when everybody who's placed their trust into Christ will have dinner with the Savior. And so Jesus takes this small offering and he blesses it, and he keeps giving it to the disciples. Remember, there's 12 disciples set before them, and he divided up the two fish among them all. And as it's happening, the two pickled fish turn into what we could say uncursed fish, fish that, that weren't pickled, fish that, that never had been in the Sea of Galilee. It was a miracle straight from heaven on the spot, biscuits like you've never tasted before, and everybody liked fish that day including my father, if he were there. (laughs) Amazing fish. The best fish and biscuits you've ever had. And it just keeps coming. And all these people start getting the meal. And it's not just enough. And when Philip said, okay, even if we had 40K, even if we had 200 denarii, it wouldn't be enough to even just give everybody a little bit. Here's what happens? And they all ate and were satisfied. See that in verse 42? They were filled up. The word could be translated gorge, filled to the full. They had more than enough grace and grace upon grace, like waves upon a seashore that never stop. That's how God gives in this beautiful scene. Divided up the two fish, and they all ate and were satisfied And they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. Not huge baskets. The word translated basket is there for a a hand basket, a traveler's sack. 12, hmm, that's interesting. Jesus is going to use this lesson. I take it that the 12 disciples walked away with dinner leftovers. 
that they won't be able to forget a little later on in the next scene. Also, the fish, all of this. And there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Jesus responded by teaching them, heralding the good news. That is the message. That's how we are to respond, that we bring the good news, that we clearly, unshamedly proclaim the gospel. That's what we're to be about. Yes? And we also respond by meeting people's real physical needs with the compassion, with the mercy of Jesus Christ. And we look out and we go, we can't meet all these needs. But you know what? I know that we serve a God who can do amazing things to meet people's needs. One pastor, Chris Brooks, who's now the senior pastor of Woodside Bible Church in Troy, he said, good works lead to good will, which leads to good news opportunities. So we do the beautiful works of God by showing his mercy And that leads to good news opportunities, goodwill in people's hearts, and we preach the gospel of the kingdom. I found out about a church down in Indiana, Northview Church. They preach the gospel there. Two deacons actually here from our church sent me this article about this church and about this this, organization this church worked with. They found in their community that there were about four million people dollars worth of medical debt in their community. Okay, I don't know about you, but that's a really big number, $4 million worth of medical debt. And, and so they worked with this organization that works with churches and other nonprofits. The church had this dollar a day type of thing, or, excuse me, a dollar, a dollar a year. So they just, everybody gave a dollar. It's a large church. Everybody gave a dollar. And then they said, you know what? We, we're, we want to erase all the medical debt in our community because that would be loving our neighbor in an extraordinary Christ kind of way. And so they raised $30,000 and this organization called RIP, Rest in Peace Medical Debt, or, you know, RIP Medical Debt, took that $30,000 and through their, I guess, pretty on-the-ball type of employees, actually used that $30,000 to pay, this says $2 million of medical debt. CNN reported it as $4 million worth of medical debt over two years has been retired by this church through an offering of $30,000. I'm like, what? How does that work? God can do that. Can you imagine the goodwill in the hearts of the community when they find out that Jesus followers wiped out their medical debt? I'm like, what? And then you share the good news of Jesus. These are opportunities that, that I'm looking for. I was, I was overjoyed that two of our deacons sent me this article about this church. We're looking for opportunities like that. We could say, you know, as Mayfair Bible Church, we don't have this much. We only got five loaves, two pickled fish, enough for our lunch. Pray and see what God does. And, and don't walk in a refusal to trust that leads to sarcasm or unbelief. And I'm preaching to the choir. And I'm preaching to myself. Because I know you want to follow Jesus in his blueprints. Jesus saw, Jesus felt, Jesus responded by teaching and by serving them in an extraordinary way. And he calls us to do the same. We can be as grace-giving as God is. God has forgiven us how big a debt? an immeasurable debt we could never pay. And boy, what an analogy to the gospel that this church wipes out $4 million worth of medical debt, a debt many of those people could never pay. And they say, hey, let me tell you about the one who erases your ultimate debt. His name is Jesus Christ, to be as grace-giving as God is. You want to be part of that Mayfair Bible Church? That's what I want to see God do. That's what we can pray God will do through us. So then the story continues here, and we're going to look at this briefly. Jesus immediately made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. And when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea. He was alone on the land, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. 
At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. That's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. In darkness, at night, late in the night. It's dark. How could he see them? Because he's God in the flesh. He's out on the hillside praying. He sees down into the Sea of Galilee, and they've been rowing for 9 to 12 hours, depending on how you do the math. They're just in one of those gust storms that had blown in from those, those cliffs down into the channel there into the Sea of Galilee, and it's blowing in these white caps, and they're just, they can't get out of it. And they're going hour after hour after hour, and when he saw... Look at that. Seeing them straining at the oars for the wind was against them. And that's what it looks like to try to do life or ministry in your own strength. See the point of this whole thing? It's God who does it. It's Jesus' power. It's Jesus' work. Walking on the sea. No, don't miss this. For the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He intended to pass by them. Jesus wanted to pass by them. If you have some biblical theology in your mind right now, you know that God passed by who? He passed by Moses, right? Remember that? Some people have said this is almost like a theophany experience. Jesus wanted to pass by this is, this is something that would startle them, something that would wake them up out of their still dull spiritual understanding. For they all, look it, but then they saw him walking on the sea. They supposed that it was a ghost and they cried out, I would too. You would too. Thank you for laughing over there in the left-hand corner. Yes. <laughs> for they all saw him and were terrified. They cried out. They're terrified. I think they'd be going bananas. Hudson, my son here in the front, he'd be going, ah, that's a ghost, right? He would scream. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped and they were utterly astonished. Jesus had calmed the storms not too many days earlier in the boat when he said, peace, be still. And here he gets into the boat and the wind immediately stops and there they again realize, who is this? That's from just the chapter before. Who, who does this? God. For they had not gained any insight, that is, they had not seen fully with their heart from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. They still didn't fully believe. They still didn't see clearly who Jesus really was. But God has given us four gospels, four camera views of the life of Jesus Christ, four sets of blueprints that all point to the same Christ so that we can see truly and clearly and fully who Jesus is and what it's all about. And we can believe and we can see the multitudes, and we can feel and be moved by the power of God with compassion and respond by teaching them the gospel, serving them with the compassion of Christ, and watching God work in a way that only He can do. I want you to watch a short video clip. This is from Schindler's List, uh, a movie about a man who rescued 1,100 Jews during the Holocaust, during World War II. This man was a munitions manufacturer, kind of jumped on board to, to make munitions, but used resources to buy Jews out of captivity, to buy them and set them free. I want you to watch something here. Go ahead and cue this video up. I want you to watch this closely and see the response. It's Hebrew from the Talmud. It says, whoever saves one life saves the world entire.
could have gotten off. Ask her, there are 1,100 people who are alive because of you. Look at them. If I'd made more money. <laughs> I threw away so much money. <laughs> you have no idea. If I just... There will be generations because of what you did. I didn't do enough. You did so much. This car. Oh, God, what about this car? Why did I keep the car? Ten people right there. Ten people. Ten more people. This pin. Two people. This is gold. Two more people. You would have given me two for At least one. You would have given me one. The person was there for this. I could have become one poor person, and I didn't. And I didn't. <laughs> Just one more. You sense that desperation in his face, tears in his eyes. I could have, I could have saved one more. What if I, why did I keep the car? It could have been 10 more people saved. As we look out over the needs, the spiritual needs of people in our community, and I wonder how many people do we just pass by and forget that we have the message of Jesus Christ that saves sets free people from eternal captivity, brings them into right relationship with God, people with devastating physical need. Do I have that same desperation? Do you have that same compassion welling up in your heart that there are thousands and thousands and thousands, more than 400,000 people in our county, 80% of whom do not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? vast majority of them have great physical need as well. I'm calling myself and calling you to first place your faith in the power of Christ. For salvation, place your faith in Christ for the sanctification process too. And number two, align the purpose of your life with the pattern of Christ. David Platt, pastor, said this, Make the proclamation of Jesus' word primary in a world of great spiritual need and make the power of Jesus' love evident in a world of physical need. Like that movie just portrayed, make no mistake about it, mission is going to cost you. One writer says, mission will suck your time, money, energy, privacy, preference, preferences, and your gifts. You may not be rich like Schindler. You've got a life to invest, though. And David Platt says, kingdom needs more Christians who aren't asking, what can I afford, but what's it going to take? Are you ready? <laughs>